Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Nadia Kenna. I am a research associate with the UK Data Service based at the Cathy Marsh Institute at the University of Manchester. Thank you all for coming to this introductory talk on time series analysis and forecasting. Um, now, in this talk, um, I aim to come cover some of these things, such as what is time series data, specifically comparing how it differs to cross-sectional and longitudinal data. We'll be looking at what exactly time series analysis is, the types of time series analysis available, components of TSA. We'll look at how we can fit some specific time series models, and we'll have a look at uh, one specific forecasting technique known as SARIMA or ARIMA models. And then we'll briefly discuss some of the available software. Um, I hope that this talk gives you almost like a guide or some inspiration to conduct some of your own time series analysis in your own work. Um, now, the benefits of time series analysis are, are vast, and I could spend a whole webinar talking about that in itself. But in short, it allows us to measure and analyze change, what's changed in the past, what's changing in the present, and what we can forecast to examine what changes might look like in the future. Um, so before delving into some of this content, we'll just make sure that the uh, Mentimeter polls are working and we'll start off with just, yeah, so here's the code. I think Saucer's left that in the chat for you as well. You can use a QR code or head to the website. So if you just head on over there and answer this first question, which is um, more of interest to me, but I'd just like to know what kind of software do you guys use most when running your own type of analysis or research? I'll just give you a few minutes for those answers to roll through. That's great. It looks like we only have R users here, which is the correct software to use. It's my favorite. Or oh, SBS stars coming up. It's good to hear. Good to hear. So we have a majority of users in R. Um, this is just for me to know as interest to see where we could take future webinars. Um, to see what most people are interested in learning. But yes, as you know, this live code demonstration will be taught in R. Uh, that's the second part of this webinar. So yeah, thank you so much for answering that. And we'll move on to um, some of the content. Very much appreciated. So we're gonna start with looking at what exactly is time series data. In short, it is a collection of ob observations obtained through repeated measurements of time. Now, each instance represents a different time step, and the attributes give values associated with that time. The intervals for which time series are represented is vast, as you can have hours, you can have yearly data, you can have quarterly, you can have hourly, you can also have weekly, which I've seen to uh, not included on that, but weekly is an option. And as with kind of any type of research, the first steps in your research process comes as thoroughly understanding your variable types. And when looking at time series data, um, your time interval is one of those components that you need to consider. <clears throat> so the question is, how is time series data different to just having a time field in your data set? And can longitudinal data sets be considered time series? Well, this kind of depends on how the data has been collected, as this affects how we can analyze changes in states over time. Now, I use the word changes as this is a key concept in understanding time series analysis. The major difference between time series and non-time series data is that time component. For time series data, the time factor is the dependent component, and for non-time series data, time is not necessarily a central theme. Um, we can explore this concept a little better by providing an, um, a made-up scenario. So imagine you have been asked to maintain a web application and you have been asked to analyze when a new user logs in. After some careful consideration, you've realized that there are two ways to do this. When a new user logs in, you may just update a last login time step for that user in a single row, or you decide to treat each login as a separate event. Um, I'll just give you like five or 10 seconds to let that uh, sink in, and then I'm gonna give you the option to answer this back on Mentimeter. And no worries, there's no right or wrong answer. This is just to get you guys exploring and thinking a little bit more creatively about time series data. So we'll head over to uh, Mentimeter and you can pop in your answer. 
If you asked to maintain your web application, would you choose option A or option B? Majority of people are leaning towards option B, where you treat each login as a single event. Very interesting. We have a few people who are unsure and that's absolutely okay. We're gonna go ahead and discuss the advantages and weaknesses of, of both methods in, in just a minute. That's great. So we've got about 18 people who voted in. So we'll, we'll continue on and talk about some of these benefits and um, advantages for, for both. So let's just say you have decided to choose option A, where we update the last login time step for that user in a single row. Now you might have something that looks a bit like this. We have the user and we have their company that they work for. That's just some contextual information. And then we have that last login time step. Now, although useful in examining which user works for what company, the time variant isn't of much use here. It simply provides some context, right? Whereas if we were to explore option B, which look, might look something like this, we have a new row for each time a user has logged in where those changes are preserved. And each change is a recorded as a new event. And this is where I draw importance to that word change again, because that's exactly what we're looking at. Because this allows us to examine how the frequency of login time can change over time per person or per company. Um, so to summarize time series data, Almost all data is recorded as a new entry. The data typically arrives in time order and the time intervals can be regular or irregular. And um, just to clarify what I mean by regular or irregular, time series is always classified into two types. Uh, regular time series tend to represent some sort of uh, cluster monitoring or um, aggregated data, whereas irregular events are um, those measurements gathered at irregular time intervals. And these might represent things like log intervals or uh, traces. The issue with irregular intervals is that the events are unpredictable and cannot be modeled or forecasted since forecasting assumes that whatever happens in the past is a good indicator of what will happen in the future. But if we have these irregular time frames, and that doesn't allow us to make predictions. So when um, forecasting and modeling data, your time series should be in a regular format, which is why you might see a lot of data uh, comes in aggregated formats. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, let's move on and explore some of the reasons why you might want to use uh, time series analysis and explore some of those aims. I would say that there are generally three different aims to time series analysis. The first is how we can access the impact of a single event. This could be described as a descriptive event. An example of this could be the number of crimes in Manchester. You could um, obtain the number of crimes in Manchester and observe the seasonal patterns and the upward or downward trends. That'd be a single event as we have a unit variant, um, I guess, analysis of just looking at one event. Another aim could be to study the causal patterns. This could be the effects of variables rather than the events themselves. Uh, this would be known as a, an exp explanatory analysis. And the last aim, which is very common, is to forecast future values or time series using either previous values of one series or values from another. And this is known as our prediction models. Forecasting uses the observed values of a time series with a model to predict future time series values. There are several forecasting techniques available for use with time series data. And one of those examples are the RIMA models. Um, <clears throat> we will be looking at the RIMA models as well as some um, other models in our live code demonstration as well. But I'd like to just talk about one a specific article that really draws on almost three of these aims and this was conducted by Ashby in 2020 
His aim was to understand crime patterns during the pandemic. He used police recorded open crime data to understand how the frequency of certain crime types changed from the start of the pandemic. Now his method involved using Surima models of the frequency of crime types from 16 different US cities between 2016 and 2020. He forecasts were then created from these models to compare the actual calls um, received to the expected calls um, that were calculated. Now, I would go on to explain all the results and discussions, but there's quite a lot to unpack here as the article explores five different crime types across 16 different cities. But some general notes would be that the differences between the actual calls recorded and those forecasted were different in each, different in each city. One example being that there were reductions in burglary in most cities. Um, so what this paper had helped to do is understand or identify a relationship between the pandemic and crime. The data in the code can be found in this link. It's also uh, attached to the GitHub link and the um, R script. So you can have a look at that in your own time. But yeah, that's just a, a really good, um, if you're looking for a really good real life example, then I'd suggest reading this paper. It goes into detail about how uh, the RIMA model was conducted and the code is available to, to do this. And yeah, with that, I will be exploring a case study that takes on an adaptation from this paper. So using some open source police recorded crime data, I'm going to be exploring the burglary rates from Detroit from 2015 to 2020, following some of that code that was created by Ashby. Now, in order to understand some of these components and all the, the fundamentals of time series analysis, I've kind of created two main aims that might be able to help us um, contextualize these, these kind of like complicated statistical terms. Well, the first aim is being, we're going to explore the long-term trend in seasonality in burglary across the city of Detroit. The second aim is to examine how the frequency of burglary changed in Detroit in 2020 from the start of the pandemic. So that is again, using those um, ARIMA models to come up with predictions. So we will be using time series graphics, time series analysis, and forecasting to answer both of these aims. Now the steps in time series analysis can be quite complicated, but I've broken this down into four main steps that will allow you to take on kind of any analysis in any data set. The first step is to explore your data set. As of any research, this means understanding your variable, type, variable types, but the difference in time series data is that you need to understand the time intervals that you have present in your data set. So that is understanding whether you have yearly, weekly, monthly, hourly, quarterly data. Um, and then step two would be identifying graphing patterns. So this is very like descriptive analysis and understanding um, the very basic patterns. And then we move on to modeling the data and then we move on to predicting. So once you have indexed those points according to a time order, you can use time series um, algorithms to create a model, right? And once you have created that model, you can use that model to predict future values. So this is just a really like broken down version of how time series would work, but um, this has always helped me in conducting my own analysis and breaking it down in really simple, simple steps. <clears throat> so let's move on to look at what a time series analysis might look like. Typically, the statistical characteristics of time series data often um, violate, violate the assumptions of conventional statistical methods. Because of this, analyzing time series data requires a, a unique set of tools and methods, and this is known as TSA, or time series analysis. Um, it's important to note that time series analysis is used for non-stationary data. Uh, this is things that are constantly fluctuating over time or affected by time. But we'll get more into this in a, in a, in a, little, in a little bit. So we can use basic time series graphs to basically plot the observed value on the y-axis against an increment of time on the x-axis. Most time series graphic will look something like this. So in our instance, we might expect to see our y-value, which is our burglary rates, 
against the increment of time, which was from 2015 to 2016. Um, obviously, you can get more creative with your visualizations. It wouldn't look as basic as this, but this this helps to understand um, the overall, you know, graphics to it. Um, so yeah, the first steps would be to identify kind of what time interval you would have in your data set. Um, whether this be yearly, monthly, weekly, or quarterly. But before examining this data set and before examining what we have available, I want to ask you guys, what is the most accurate interval to use for exploring crime data? What do you think is the most accurate interval for um, exploring open source crime recorded statistics? So if you head over to Mentimeter, you can just pop in an answer here. This also gives you a break from hearing my voice, but um, yeah, just have a go. And do you think that it'd be better to compare year to year data, month to month data? Um, hourly, minutes, just pop in your answers. I'll give it 30 seconds to a minute to, to, to let these roll through. All right, the numbers have slowly start, stopped to change. But yeah, okay, that's pretty, pretty interesting what we see. So we see that 42% of, of you guys think that monthly data would be the best interval followed by weekly, followed by other, which I'm actually very curious to know what, what that might be. And then we have yearly and hourly. Well, I'll briefly talk about kind of some benefits to, to some of these, but um, yearly data is, is accurate, but it's only accurate if you're looking at long-term trend. It tends to miss information as it hides variation that happens within the months. So we won't be able to analyze kind of any seasonal trends. We won't be able to analyze uh, fluctuations against different seasons. We would simply just have an upward or downward trend from each year. We then have monthly data. Monthly, comparing month to month data is more accurate because we then get to analyze that seasonality. But the issue with monthly data is that it does, is that um, months do not hold the same amount of days. So some months have longer number of weekdays. So we can say that, so how can we say that um, this month has a higher number of crimes or is it just a result of a higher number of weekdays? So there's this variation in, um, yeah, the number of weekdays and how this affects, how this is affected by crime reporting because do we have higher number of crimes reported on weekdays or higher number of crimes reported on on weekends and how does this affect the overall frequency of crime per month? So these are things that you would have to consider when using month to month analysis. We then move on to weekly data, which 29% of people have suggested is, is a good interval. And I would like to agree with you. I would say that weekly data basically minimizes that variation from month to month to year to year data and is quite a uh, frequent interval used in recent research for understanding crime. Uh, hourly data and like minutes basically, um, they are more useful if you're analyzing like a single event, a single event rather than over a huge amount of time. And this is because the smaller the time frame, the increased amount of noise in your data set. And that is something that you would want to avoid. We'll discuss a little bit further on what noise is, but this is basically uncontrolled variation. Um, so for this reason, and following the work of Ashby as well, he suggested that weekly trends provide kind of the best interval for understanding police recorded crime data. That is not to say that yearly data or monthly data can't be used. It just affects um, the outcome of your results in that you know, yearly data, you will be limited to just understanding the trends. Um, so yeah, these are just things to kind of consider when choosing your interval. But yeah, I have decided to then um, create a frequency count of weekly data of burglary in our case study. And I created a plot that looks something like this. Like this. <laughs> um, so what we have here is a really basic time series plot. 
we have our weekly incident of burglary on our y-axis and we have our increment of time on the x-axis from 2015 to 2020. <coughs> So what this plot what this plot shows um, quite quite clearly is a downward trend, right? From 2015 to 2020, we can say that the overall count of frequency has definitely decreased as the years has gone on. But how much is there to say about the seasonality, and how much is there to say about other hidden trends? It's quite hard to read this. You see, we have these like um, really high numbers of counts of burglary in 2016. Why were they so high in this year? Um, is this just noise? Is this uncontrolled variation? And um, in time series analysis for forecasting new values, it's very important to know about the past data. There can be many reasons which cause our forecasted values to fall in the wrong direction. And factors like these might be one of the issues. So if you want to explore further trends, then you need to look at the components of time series analysis because the variation of these components cause the changes in the patterns of time series, in the patterns that we see here. So let's move on to have a look at those components of time series analysis. There are four main components known as trend, the cyclical behavior, the seasonality, and that noise that we've mentioned before. The trend typically represents the decreasing or increasing pattern in like statistics, this is known as the linearity. We then have our cyclical behavior or cyclical uh, variation. And this variation in the time series tends to operate themselves over a span of more than two years. We then have our seasonality, and these are the rhythmic forces which operate in a regular manner over the space of less than a year. So that's the main difference between the two. Cyclical tends to happen over two years and seasonality are patterns that happen within a year. We then have our random or irregular movements, also known as our noise. Um, this is basically any other factor which causes variation in the variable under the study. So um, as mentioned, noise is like, likely to be higher when you have, when analyzing shorter time periods, so if we were using month to month data, you might expect increased noise or even hour, hourly data would expect increased noise because there's more uncontrolled variation within the time frame. Now the, com the combinations of these components with time causes the formation of a time series. It's important to note that most time series consist of a trend and a noise, but the cyclical and the seasonality variations are optional in that they might or might not exist in your data, depending on the data that you have at hand. Um, if the seasonality and trend are part of the time series, then there will be effects in the forecast values as the patterns of the forecasted value of the forecasted time series um, can be different from the older time series. I'd like to also just draw on the fact that the combination of these four components can either lead to an additive or a multiplicative model. Now, I don't wanna uh, get too complicated with these terms and well, bore you to death with statistics, but it's really important to know how these four components can shape your, your uh, model for time series. So let me just explain what I mean by an additive and a multiplicative model. An additive model might look, an additive model is the increasing or decreasing pattern of the time series is uh, similar throughout the series. This is when all those components are added together, hence the name. And then we have a multiplicative model, which is if the time series has an exponential growth or a decreasement with time, then this would be multiplicative. And this would be when all your components are multiplied together. So it's not too confusing to understand, but it's really helpful to see how this might look like um, by visualization. So I've just provided these two examples here. In this case, an additive model here has 
an increasing pattern, but we have the same amplitude between our time points. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, so we have the same amplitude between our time points. But with a uh, multiplicative model, what we have is this change in um, amplitude over time. It um, could be increasing, could be decreasing, same with the additive. But the main difference is that that amplitude between the two points um, differ quite a bit, right? So we can bring this back to our case study and start to think about what kind of trend we have. Do we have an additive or do we have a multiplicative plot? So I'll just show you this plot again. This is what, this is our basic time series plot, looking at weekly trends. Can we say that this trend is additive or can we say this trend is multiplicative? And I'll give you a moment kind of just to explore this a little bit and think about this. And you can head over to Mentimeter again and just, Put in your opinion. Do you think that this plot is additive or multiplicative, or you you have no idea? Looks like majority of votes so far have been leaning towards additive. We've got quite a few that say multiplicative, multiplicative as well. Yeah, let me uh, break this down a bit. So the majority seem to think that we have an additive model and 21% seem to think we have a multiplicative. Um, well done to those who vote, voted multiplicative. This is in fact a multiplicative model because we have a decreasing trend with changes in the amplitude between the points, which in turn produces larger intervals of seasonality. Um, an additive model would highlight almost a constant trend, like a very, if we would have the same averaged amount of crimes as the years go on if it was to be additive. And this might be more of a, a straight line. Um, but yeah, this is a multiplicative model. So when reviewing the line plot, it suggests that there may be a decreasing crime trend throughout the historical changes, but it is hard to distinguish if there is seasonality or noise or even any kind of like cyclical behavior, right? The only thing we could really confirm from that is, um, is the trend. But we can explore the other components of time series analysis by decomposing our models. Through decomposing the models, we can clearly model the individual components and get precise information about whether the series is stationary or not. Um, so yeah, as discussed, the time series is considered to be a sum or combination of these four components. So let's have a look at what would happen if we were to decompose our model. Now I've already gone ahead and done this and made this plot for you. And this is what a decomposition model might look like. There are four graphs in this image. The first graph highlights our original data. The second graph highlights our trend. That is that decreasing trend that we see. And our seasonal data highlights um, some seasonal patterns. As you can see from each year, we have this really same repeated pattern every year, which would indicate that there is some seasonality present in this data set, which isn't surprising with, with crime data at all. Um, we also have the remainder or the noise components, which I'm not going to delve in too much at the moment, but um, if you are familiar with um, ACFs and lags, this is what your expected to see, but we'll address some of this in the live code demonstration as well. Um, so yeah, we can clearly see that there's a seasonal, com seasonal component and there's definitely some sort of downward trend. So once we know these patterns and trends and, and um, the basic like structures to our data, we can then go and check to see if the 
see if the series is stationary or not. Um, if the series is not stationary, then it is necessary to make the series stationary. So let me just provide some context about what stationarity exactly is and how we can test for this. Stationarity, in short, is when its statistical properties such as the mean, the variance and the covariance remain constant over time. Um, the formal way to check for this is by either plotting the data, as we have seen through the decomposition plots, or by using um, some more like advanced statistical tests known as the KPPSS, the Dickey-Fuller test. There's also the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, which uses the unit root test. Um, but yeah, that just basically evaluates whether there's a no hypothesis in one way or another using the alpha value of one and the p value of 0 0.05 we can look for a no hypothesis but yeah visually we could say that the plot does show that, that visually the plot shows what we had trend and that we had seasonality and that means that this series is not stationary and this is because that mean is not constant over time there was changes in the in the trend and there was changes in the seasonality. Typically, stationary data is quite flat looking. You wouldn't expect to see a trend and you would have a constant variance over time. You'd also have a constant autocorrelation uh, structure over time. You would have no periodic fluctures based on the seasonality. Um, but using a stationary data set means that the model can do predictions based on the fact that the mean and the variance will remain the same in future periods. And this is why we'd have to shift a non-stationary data set to a stationary one. Um, in order to do this, you would have to differentiate your data set, also known as differencing. Uh, this isn't a completely like key concept here, but it is necessary to know when um, understanding our ARIMA models, as this is a big part of how we shift from non-stationary to stationary. Um, but yeah, that was uh, just a stationary aspect. So now we've broken down the components of time series analysis, we can use this to create models for our forecast. There are many models to consider, such as the um, moving averages model. This is the like most simplest and basic of all time series forecasting methods. This model is used for unit variate, that is one variable time series. And in an MA model, the output or the um, future variable is assumed to have a linear dependence on the current and past values. That means that the new series is created from the average of the past values, hence the name moving averages. We then have a single exponential smoothing model which is really common in like economics and financial data this is also used for unit variate series and this is when the new values are calculated from the weighted averages of past values so a little bit different to the moving average um, there are extended versions of this smoothing so you could have the the single sorry is used for when there is data with no trend or seasonality a double model would be used for when there is trend in the data. And then the triple would be used for when all three exist, that is trend, seasonality, and noise are all present in the data set. Um, and the last model that I'd like to kind of talk about is our ARIMA and CIRIMA models I've said a bit about. They are suitable for multivariate non-stationary data. Um, so yeah, we'll be using a variation of this model to answer our second aim, which asks how burglary trends compared to the predicted trends over the pandemic. Um, so why ARIMA models? Well, they are, should get to the next slide, sorry. So yeah, they stand for seasonal autoregressive integrated moving average models, which is a very long and complicated term, but I'm gonna try my best to break this down in a much simpler and clearer explanation. They're simply used to predict future trends for time series.
is a form of regression analysis that evaluates the strength of the dependent variable relative to other changing variables. So what makes this um, regression so different is that our dependent variable is, of course, a time variable, um, which is very um, different if you were analyzing like cross-sectional data set. Um, So yeah, a, it's basically a linear equation in which the predictors consist of lagged variables of the dependent variables and the lags of the forecasted errors. But we'll move on just to a, um, a slide for those who are a bit more interested in the statistics behind the ARIMA models. We'll see what these seasonal autoregressive integrated and moving av average components might look like if you were to write this down on paper. So here we have a slide um, which does contain a bit of information, so please don't feel overwhelmed. But basically, an ARIMA model contains three values, a P, a D, a Q. ARIMA without the S means that this is a non-seasonal model. The P stands for our um, AR, which is our autoregressive, and this indicates a trend order. Our D stands for the integration, which is the differencing. So that's how we make a series uh, stationary. And then we have our Q, which indicates the moving average or uh, the trend order of a moving average. So a rumor model really combines a lot of these, um, a lot of these methods and a lot of these um, models to time series analysis. We then have a Saruma model, which is the exact same as an aroma model, but includes a seasonal component. So we have the same PDQ, which indicates um, the autoregressive, the integration, and the moving average. But we then capitalize the PDQ to indicate the seasonal components. So then we have a seasonal autoregressive, a seasonal integration, and a seasonal moving average. We also have this extra value, which is M, and this is just the number of time steps for a single period. So this letter is typically denoted by, if you were interested in quarterly data, this would be represented by a four. If you were interested in yearly data, this would be indicated by, um, sorry, if you're interested in yeah, yearly data, it'd be a one, monthly data would be a 12, and weekly data would be a 52, and so on, so on. <clears throat> um, luckily for us, we're using computation to compute these for us, so there's no need to figure out how to calculate all these values yourself. Uh, we'll be using some functions in R to do some on some uh, practice data sets, so you can get an understanding about how these models can be used to predict future values. But for those that who are interested, um, in how do you choose those values for PDQ and capital PDQ? Well, this is where we talk back to the autocorrelation function. Um, the ACF tells us how correlated a time series is to its previous values. It is the correlation between observations of a time series separated by K times units. So that's just um, that M that we discussed in the previous slide. And then we have the partial autocorrelation function. And this indicates the seasonality. And this measures the strength of the relationship, other terms being accounted for. Um, yeah, so these are this, that's the very like simple but backbone of Arima models and how these are constructed and how these are put together. But as discussed, we luckily have um, automated functions and packages to do this for us, yay. So we don't have to deal with all the maths. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I ran a, a rumor model on our Detroit burglary data set to kind of compare the expected trends to the predicted trends in 2020. So I'll show you what my plot looked like. 
Oh, sorry, I did uh, skip a slide. So, so how do we build? How do we build this array model? Again, I've broken this down into kind of four main steps. The first would be to count the weekly crime. Uh, that is because our increment of time we're interested in is the is the weekly. But you can you can use monthly, you can use yearly. This always dependent on the data you have available. As I said, you would then model the weekly calls. Uh, you would use functions such as Arima from the Fable package. You could also use auto.arima, which uh, I'll be demonstra demonstrating how to use. And then you would generate your forecast using the forecast function. And then you would plot the forecast. So really four simple steps. Um, and yeah, I'll show you all how to do this in R and we can then explore how I basically got this this image, this this graph, this plot. What we're looking at here is the um, the expected calls received in 2020 compared to the predicted calls. The expected calls fall along this um, this dotted line here with the with the circles, and the predicted calls falls within this dash line that sits within this gray bracket. And what we can see is that the actual calls received are far lower than the predicted calls. And this is because, as discussed in Ashby, um, the COVID-19 pandemic led to substantial changes in the daily activities of, of, well, of, of everyone due to changes in stay-at-home orders, due to distancing, due to um, more people working from home. There was reduced opportunity for these kind of crimes to take place. And this is what ARIMA models allow us to do. They allow us to understand that relationship between crime and people's daily activities. Um, Yeah, so what we have here is a raw model. What I did was count the weekly crimes. I then modeled the data from 2015 to 2020. I then created the, the forecast and then I then, uh, then I plotted the data. But there are um, other effects that you could include in, include in this. For example, you could include a holiday effect. Um, you could donate a binary variable that indicates whether this week had a bank holiday in it. And you could then possibly establish a causal relationship between the frequency of crime and bank holidays. And that, these are ways that you can extend your models, but um, I didn't include that in, in this one. So yeah, that kind of draws conclusion to the main components and models and kind of the like underlying concepts that um, make up a time series analysis. And I hope that I've been able to provide some information. Uh, before finishing up, I would like to just draw relevance to some of the softwares that are available. You now, obviously most people have said that they use R, so I suspect you're familiar with the packages for time series analysis. This would be the Fable and the Forecast, the T-Series, there's at least another five that, that run um, time series analysis, but um, preference is, is different for everyone. One function that I will be looking at is the auto.arima function, as discussed. Um, this is basically a combination of the, the unit root test, which uh, it's like a minimization of the, the AIC and the BIC, which are just um, like the correlation coefficients to obtain an ARIMA model. But as of any kind of automated function, you have to think about how um, this might over or under predict your data, how it might um, ignore some, ignore variation and things like that. But we also have Python, which the libraries for the um, time series are Pandas, that's models, kick it learn. And we also have this nifty little uh, website made by Facebook actually called FB Profit. So they developed an open source forecasting tool available in R and Python. It was written in C++, but it's basically used for additive models with non-linear trends, and they fit yearly, weekly, daily, and seasonal trends, as well as a holiday effect. Um, this is a really useful tool if you're looking at just creating um, really simple and effortless time series models. I would have a look at FB Profit because they work nicely within Python and R. 
but yeah, uh, thank you all for listening to that talk. We've just gone 15 minutes, which is perfect. So if anyone has any questions, I'll give you the opportunity to ask that now. Uh, you're welcome to type that into Mentimeter or the Q&A on Zoom. And yeah, feel free to ask some questions. We'll also have a break just after this as well. Is it possible to share the data and codes? On? Yes, um, someone has asked, is it possible to share the data and um, codes underlying the results? Yes, that's exactly what the live code demonstration will do. And all of this is available on GitHub as it is. Um, and then we'll talk through, we'll talk through the rest. Uh, missed the question. Please can you talk about the additive multiplicative distinction and how this affects the ARIMA modeling process? Uh, yeah, of course. So, as discussed, there are two types of um, time series analysis additive or multiplicative, and this is dependent on um, whether you have trend, seasonality, or noise present in your data set. Uh, typically, an ARIMA model will account for this automatically and it will figure out if you have an additive or a multiplicative data. That is, have these components added together to make up your trends or have they multiplied? And um, I'll be looking, I can show you actually how to do this in the live code demonstration and we can break this down a little bit further. Um, yeah, I hope that's helped. But. Yeah, I'll demonstrate this further because it's easier to demonstrate it with some 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 code at hand. Hi everyone. Um, I hope you've had some time to stretch your legs, grab a coffee, get a drink, and. Uh, get yourself ready for the code demonstration. As I said, it's not completely necessary to clone this repo onto your own computer, but if you would like to explore it uh, yourself, then this will be available and will be um, yeah available from the UKDS GitHub link for well permanently. So yeah, and any changes made to this code today, I will push the changes, and all you have to do is pull the changes. So yes. Um, hopefully everyone is back and ready and I'll take a slow walk through this code demonstration. Um, so yeah, here are some of the uh, links on the references used from um, Ashby's paper as well as his code, which is here. Um, there's also the crime data and R package, which we'll be using which is linked here. This is an open source crime data from, from the US. If you would like information about how to set your working directory, that is how to specifically uh, clone the GitHub repo, then there's a line here on line 30 about how to do that. That means that everything that I have on my computer that you have on your computer. Um, and here are some links to install the packages as well as to um, uh, as well as to load the packages, sorry. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions before we get started, then please ask away, but otherwise I'm just going to take a slow walk through the section one script. Um, so shall we have a Q&A question? Is there any chance we could make my face smaller and the studio screen bigger? I'm not sure if that's just their computer setup, but... Um, 
Ah, no problem for it. I'm glad it's sorted, no problem. Thanks for asking the question anyways. <clears throat> uh, I can zoom in if need be, but yeah, let me know if the, this view is okay for everyone. Yeah, uh, with section one of the R markdown file, we will be looking at some time series data representations. We'll be looking at how to convert time series objects. We'll be looking at um, making decomposition plots. We'll be checking for stationarity and we'll be applying some um, rolling averages to some data sets. And section one specifically uses um, synthetic data sets and open source data sets. And then section two will take a turn and look at how to basically apply some data manipulation using the Dipler package and the Lubridate package to work with time series data and to work with um, time intervals. So yeah, let's get um, let's get started. So yeah, we'll first start by demoing some different types of time series data. Typically, when working with data in R, you need to decide the object class of your data at hand. This is important because the object class you choose affects more than that the data is stored. This will dictate which functions will be available for data pre-processing, data for analyzing, uh, data wrangling, as well as plotting your data. Typically data in R is stored as a vector. Um, and a vector is in short, the most simplest and it's the most simple data structure in R. And it represents a sequence of data elements of the same basic type. I think there are six different vector types. There's numeric, integer, logical, date time, factors, and characters. I think that was six. Um, however, when working with time series data, we tend to have to convert the object class into what is known as a time series object or a TS. Now, R has at least eight different implementations of data structures for representing time series data. The list below identifies some of the frequently, the most frequently used packages. We'll be looking mainly at TS and uh, T-Civil, but I will demonstrate some examples in Zoo and XTS as well. Um, so yeah, the first thing we'll be looking at is a time series object called uh, Kings. This is an example of a small time series data set, and it records the age of deaths of 42 successive kings in England. The data set can be found in this link by Robert Heinemann. Um, but this data set can, is, is recorded as a text file, so we can use the function scan, I think from the stats package to read in this data set. I've also applied the function skip equals three, which basically skips the first three lines of data because they included um, attribute information that just wasn't part of the data frame. So if we run this, and then we can view the data set by just typing in king, you see that we have 42, um, 42 objects which represent our kings and the ages that go with those kings. We can examine the type of object we have, that is the data structure itself, by using the class function. And as you can see, we have a numeric object. However, this isn't very useful if we wanted to plot time series objects because it doesn't know that we're treating our dependent variable at the time. So in order to convert a data frame to a time series object, we can use the TS function. Um, just to clarify, a time series object is a vector, which is univariate, or a matrix, which is multivariate with additional attributes. So yeah, let's use the TS function to convert our King's, King's data set. All I've done is called on the data set, applied the assignment operator, use the TS function and <coughs> run that. Now if we check the class again, you see that we have a TS object instead of numeric. So let's see how this will look if we print King. That's great. Now we have a time series object with a start date, an end date, and a frequency. The frequency indicates one because this is a unit variate data set. Um, all we have is the age of the kings at which they died, and, and that's it. But I can provide a bit of a more better example by using um, 
data that includes seasonality. So yeah, what happens if we have data that has been collected more at more regular intervals? That could be monthly, that could be weekly, could be quarterly. And if this is the case, you would have to specify the number of times that the data was collected per year using the frequency parameter. So let's explore this with a different data set named births, which refer to the number of births per month in New York City from 1946 to 1958. Again, this data set can be found here by Robert Hindman. And uh, the code to run this looks something like this. So we call on the TS function, we supply the vector, we give a start and end date, and we also identify the frequency. So let's see how we can do this with the birth data set. First things first again is to use our scan function as it's a text file to read the data set. And if we examine this, we see we have this quite messy data frame with uh, over 160 rows and a value associated to each row. But there is no current time in this data set, is there? But we know this is a time data set because this is um, it's on the website. It was created by Robert Hyman and um, <clears throat> we can use that TS function to convert this into a time series object with our dates. So I know that there are, so yeah, we call on the vector, which is births, and then we apply the frequency. In this instance, I know it's 12. I know we're looking at monthly data because this was all on the website. And I know that the start date was 1946 on January, hence the number one. So if we run this and then rerun the uh, function first, we see we have a much neater data set with um, our birth rate given by month and year, which is really neat. So now with this, we can go ahead and create some time series plots. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and run some time series plots. We can do this on both seasonal or non-seasonal data, and we can use the plot TS function to do so. So if we just run it on the King data set, we'll have something that looks like this. What we have, hopefully you can see that, is our time variable on the bottom, which this instance is represented by the age of kings, which can be confusing, but, but stay with me. And then we have the death at which the kings had happened. So this is really, really simple. Uh, time series analysis as we only have a unit variant uh, data frame. If we run this on the birth data set, we get something that looks like this, which is kind of much more common than what we saw in the slides. We have our time variables from 1946 to 1960, and we have the um, births at which the average births per month across here. You can definitely see that there is some um, trend. There's definitely some sort of upward trend from 1948, as well as some evident seasonality um, where we have fluctuations in the data set. But again, it's hard to say that if this is due to seasonality or if this is due to monthly variation. And this is what we're going to be exploring in this section. Uh, you can also plot TS objects using ggplot, which is, uh, I guess, much more common, actually. A lot of people like to use autoplot just because there's more uh, flexibility in the functions that are available. So you need to load and install the ggfortify function. And let's just see what happens if we use autoplot instead of plot.ts. In this instance, we get something that looks like this. Pretty much, very much the same, apart from this background that has changed, right? Um, this is preference. I like to have this background as it, I think it's just easier to read on the eyes. But there are also, um, you can also apply a color. So if you run auto plot, call on the burst function, uh, the burst object, sorry. And we can use the ts.color function to make this trend pop a little. So let's just go with red. And you can also use TS dot line type to change the style of the line. I'm going to use dashed just for. Hmm. 
That's strange. That is strange. I misspelled something. Also, uh, ts dot color equals red ts dot line type is dashed. I, I'm not too sure why that hasn't changed. TS dot color equals red, TS dot line type equals dash that. Should work, it should in theory work. Um, anyways, we'll move past that and we'll try to see if the TS geon function works in. That is. Very strange because I had just done this before. Um, let's try it really long. Anyways, um, well, that was only just to change the graphics, so it's not entirely important, but um, these functions should, unless it's good, no, should work on your computer. Uh, apologies about that. I'm not quite sure why that hasn't, hasn't worked. Um, oh, we'll move past that. It's only, it's only for the graphics, so that's no problem. Um, if we have some time at the end, I'll come back and see if I can, if I can fix that. But yeah, uh, now we're going to move on to plotting with the forecast package. We're going to be using the auto.arima function to, to run this bit. As you know, uh, what the auto.arima function does is return the best arima model according to either the AIC or the BIC. So this function conducts a search over all the possible models and basically provides the best one for you. Um, so we know that an Aruma model is partly autoregressive, and we know that this is trying to understand or trying to explain future values of birth rate using past values. Um, we also know that there's a MA function, which we are using a white noise error term to explain future values. Um, this combined gives you an ARMA model, ARMA, which obviously doesn't include this integration. So oftentimes this is when the series needs to become, and this oftentimes series are non-stationary, but they need to become stationary. And this is what the integration does. It tells you how many times the values need to become differentiated in order for the series to become stationary. Um, now, if you were to calculate this by hand, then you would use the AIC and the BIC. However, auto.aruma does all these calculations for us. So let's explore this a bit better. So yeah, you, this is uh, run by the forecast package to make sure that's run. And what I've done here is created a new object called births arima. I've assigned the assignment operator, and then I use the auto.arima function. I then call in the uh, vector births, and I tell auto.arima that the seasonality is true. Um, this part of the code isn't completely necessary. Auto.arima should just pick that up anyways but sometimes it's useful just to um, put this in so that your model is clearer and you know what's, what's going on. So if we run this birth.arima function and we can then print the summary, we get this output that looks something like this. The second row indicate our arima uh, figures. And what we see here is a, it contains two autoregressive lags. It contains, um, it's differentiated by one, and it includes two moving averages. For the seasonal component, there is one autoregressive lag, one differentiation, and one moving average. We then also have that time frame, which is 12 in this instance, which indicates that this is monthly data. Um, 
So through that, we can then examine um, these coefficients and these residuals by plotting them because it's much easier to read and understand once we plot the residuals. And you can do this by using the function check residuals. And then you just apply the Buffs ARIMA into um, parentheses. So if we run that, we will get a image that looks something like this. We have three graphs here, which is um, basically the res residuals should approximately be white noise. That is um, a process with no structure. This means that the mean should be a constant of zero. It should really indicate around this zero value. Um, in our instance, it's not entirely near zero, but I still wanted to use this as a demonstration because um, you can still plot auto.aruma functions that um, don't have that mean around zero. We also see the ACF plot to the left here. And um, in an ideal case, there wouldn't be any lags, as in these lines would sit between the confidence intervals. Um, but we're still going to go ahead and use this as a forecast. It won't obviously mean that we create the perfect forecast, but these are the things you need to consider when using auto.arima because, as I said, they can over predict your um, AIC and your BIC values. So now we've um, run the model, we can then make the forecast. And we do this by um, what I've done is created a new object called burst forecasts. And I've signed this again to the forecast function. We then call on the burst ARIMA. So this is our ARIMA model. And we indicate H equals 12. And uh, H is just how many periods ahead do we want to forecast for? And because we know it's monthly data, I've decided to just put in 12. So we forecast for 12 months ahead. So if we run this and we print the values, we get a bunch of values here, which indicate our uh, confidence intervals. But you would read it as like, um, so January 1960 has a 27.7% forecast increase um, compared to the previous year. But obviously, what we'd want to do is really plot these and get these on a the graph. So you can use that also plot function again to plot your forecast. And once you do that, you have this really um, nifty little bit that indicates the forecasted value for 12 months. So we could say that in 1960, there would be an increase in um, birth rates from the first half of the year. And then from the middle of the year, we have this decrease in birth rates. So yeah, also that Aruma has the ability to decide whether or not the data used to train the model needs a seasonal differencing. However, sometimes the data might not be able to clearly express its behavior and also Aruma needs a nudge in the right direction, I suppose. Um, and this is where our decompositions come in handy. So we can go ahead and decompose our time series to explore some of those individual trends. As discussed, a decomposition is simply a, um, an addition or multiplication of your four components. In order to decompose a time series, you can just use the decompose function, which is here from the stats package. Let me just check that is from the stats package. Yes, it is from that. Yeah, you can run that function. Again, I've created a new object called birth decomp. Call this onto the decompose function and I've included the original data set births into that. If we run that and view, um, we can use the head function to view the first five rows of the data set. We see that we have our X values, which are our original values. We have our seasonal values. We have our, scroll down a bit, we have our trend values and we have our random um, components. So this is simply just broken down those four components and 
split these into more readable trends so that we can analyze each one individually. So again, you can just uh, plot this data. So we can plot that same graph that we saw in the slides by using plot and including the buff dot decom. And now we have a decomposition of our time series. It's also identified that it is an additive series. That's what plot does. Um, it tells you if it's additive or multiplicative. So you don't even need to figure that out yourself, which is very handy. But yeah, as you can see, we definitely have some sort of um, increasing trend. There is definitely some seasonality present. We have this kind of repeated pattern as each year goes on. Um, and yeah, you could improve these graphics because although this highlights a random noise uh, model, you might want to plot this um, using what we saw in the graph, which was made using the auto plot function. So you can basically use the, um, this one, I've forgotten the name. I've forgotten the name of this function, but you can use this to um, run code in all, all in one line. So what we've done is called on burst and said, and then decompose and then auto plot. And then we get this looking graph, which is a little bit more uh, readable and a little bit more presentable. You can see those lags that put to place. Um, yeah, much, much clearer indeed. Now, we have just decomposed a seasonal time series, but how would you go ahead and decompose a non-seasonal? And you might be thinking, why would you want to do that if there is no seasonal component? But as I stated, that all time series does include a trend and a noise element. So if you were to decompose a non-seasonal time series, all you'd be doing is removing that noise from it and reducing some of that variation. So we can go ahead and explore how we could do this with the um, King's data set as this was a one day as this was a non-seasonal. And one way to do this is to use a smoothing method, such as the simple moving average. Um, this can be used to smooth time series, and it is the SMA function under the TTR package. So I'll write this out for you. We can decompose non-seasonal. Uh, we'll use the King's data set. So I'm going to create a new object called King's decom. Use the assignment operator and apply the SMA function from the TTR package, which looks like that. I have downloaded it and loaded it already. And then from there, you call on the original data set, which is called King. And then you need to set a moving average order. Uh, typically, this number kind of stems from like, well, it could be anything, but I'm going to set a moving average order of n equals five. And if we run that, and then use the plot.ts function on the king decomp, we now have this smoothed version of the king's data set, which has removed some of that uncontrolled variation. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> so another question to answer is um, how would you remove seasonality from a data set and why would you want to remove seasonality? Typically, many industries experience like fluctuations in various uh, metrics based on the time of the year. This means that it's not possible to effectively assess the performance by comparing data from one time of year one time of year to another. Um, and these seasonal variations can sometimes hide important um, trends. So sometimes you might just be interested in that trend and you want to remove the seasonal component. And this is how you would do it. Um, in the context of the birth data set, let's just say, for example, if the birth rates were to increase in September, could we say that this was due to seasonal variation or an actual increase in birth rates? Now, to get these answers, we could remove that seasonality. Um, if you have an additive model, which we have in this case, you would simply minus that seasonal component. 
if you had a multiplicative model, you would divide that seasonal component. So I've created a new object called adjusted births, called on the births data set, and I am minusing the seasonal component from the decomposition object, as you see here. So once we do this and plot the adjusted data, now we have a seasonally adjusted data set that removes that seasonal component and allows us to solely focus on that trend. Um, again, this would be you know, up to you as a researcher if this was an interest in you or if you wanted a seasonal component, then, then, um, then you wouldn't run this. Yeah? You would only really run this if you're interested in that linearity between years. Um, as mentioned in the slides, there are two ways to check for stationarity. You have the graphical way, which is to examine the plots. So we could look at something like this. Um, in our instance, we can say that there is no constant mean in, in the King's data set. So the data set is not stationary. But there are also those statistical tests that I mentioned, one being the ADF test. Now, this is part of the T-series package. And we can run this on our King's data set. Um, the function for this is the adf.test function. So if we just run this on the King's data set, we get this um, <clears throat> we get this score of minus two, a lag order of three, and a p-value of 0 0.5. Um, now, just given the time, I won't go too much into this, but your main interest would be that p-value. Um, the p-value should be less than the significance level of 0 0.05 or 0 0.5, depending on what you set, but that has to be less than that in order to reject the whole hypothesis. So let's just say we had an alpha level of 0 0.05. Our value is higher than that, so therefore we cannot reject a null hypothesis, therefore inferring that the series is, is um, not stationary, and that's how you could confirm in your own data set. Now, moving on, I just quickly like to talk about the zoo package and how we can calculate both basic rolling values using um, functions within here. So, yeah, install this and load this into your data set. And um, basically, the zoo package consists of methods for totally ordering index observations, and it aims at performing calculations containing irregular time series of numeric vectors, matrices, and factors. <clears throat> so yeah, let's. Uh, we're going to look at a new data set called Nottingham, which highlights the average temperatures by month and year in Nottingham. This is a base package in R, so there's nothing to install or download. You should just be able to run this when you click Nottingham. As you can see, we have something very similar to our birth data set with the year and the monthly data set. Um, but this indicates the average temperature for each month, each year. So first, let's just plot the data set to see what, we, what we're looking at. We can, can we tell from this time series analysis uh, which years are the hottest? It's kind of hard to say because there is so much fluctuation going on in the seasonal patterns. So one way we could do this one way we can understand which months hold the highest values or the, the, which months are the warmest is to apply a smoothing trend. And we can do this by using the, oh, sorry, by using the roll mean function indicated here. Um, I've gone ahead and created a new object called not mean, standing for Nottingham mean. Applied the roll mean function from the zoo package, called on the data set. And then I've um, applied a K value of 12, and this K represents the um, width of the rolling average, that is the year that you want. And then I've applied fill equals NA, and we do this to fill the first 11 months, as there are not 12 previous months before this. And then we can use a line equals right, 
to model the 11 previous observations. If you were to model the 11 past observations, this would be a line equals left. And if you were to model um, the ones before and after, you would use a line equals center. So once we run this, we can examine the statistics. And as you can see, those first 11 variables are filled with those NA values. If we didn't put the NAs in, you would simply just have missing values and that would cause um, that would cause no noise in your data set. So it's always good to exclude missing values properly. And if we plot this, we then have a much more smooth data set where we can see um, some clearer trends in the data set. And lastly, I would just like to briefly talk about the XDS package. Just won't take too long, but XDS stands for an extent, extendable time series. Um, it's ex an extension of the zoo object and it includes a matrix and an index. In this example, I'm going to show you how to create an XDS object and how to convert an XDS object. So what I've done here is created an object called data. And using the R norm package, which is uh, under the stats package, we're creating 10 random observations. And that's all. So once we run that, I then want to apply those 10 random observations with a date from each one. So to do this, I use the sequence function. Um, I use the as.date function to identify the start of the time I want to use. I'm just using 2016 from the 1st of January. And then I apply a length of 10. And um, I'm doing this by days, but you can do this by months or weeks or years. So if we run this, now we have two objects, um, data, which is our observations, and our dates, which are our times. And then you can basically combine the two by using the XTX function. And here I do so uh, right here. That's the XTX function. I call on the data and I order this by the dates. And now we have a really neat uh, XX object that looks like this. Now, the preference is kind of, um, I guess up to you as a researcher, if you prefer TS objects or if you put XTX objects. Um, I tend to prefer TS objects because I like the output of those a little, little better. Uh, for example, with our NOTM object, we can convert this to a TS by using the as.xts function. So if we run this into a new object called XTS2 and then view this, we see we have a really different structure to the NOTM in that everything is listed in, in um, two columns. We have the date and then we have the observation. And it's just a little bit harder to read. There's not too many differences between, between the two. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd introduce that as a main package and all. Um, I see we're actually a little bit short on time, um, but there are two questions and then we'll take a two minute break and move on to the section two, which shouldn't take too long. Pipe, that was the word I was looking for. Thank you, yeah, for the deep drive function. function. <laughs> completely lost my mind. Uh, but yeah, I'll just take a quick two minute break while I rest my voice and then we'll move on to exploring how we can run some data manipulation on some open source crime data. Um, I'm just gonna answer two quick questions in the Q&A and then move on to section two. But uh, someone asked, can slash should additional explanatory variables be added to an ARIMA model? Uh, can they? Yes. Should they? Absolutely dependent on your um, research aims. You would use what is known as a, um, a regressor error ARIMA model, which I'm not 100% too sure how to run in, in R, but the name of that is an ARIMA model with regressors. So it is possible and I have seen it done in papers, but um, I haven't got too much information about how to do that in R. 
We also have a second question, which is if I want time series trends in different countries, do I need to create a different object for each one? Um, you wouldn't, you don't necessarily have to, you could aggregate and um, combine the time series, but for, it also depends how many countries you have, you know, I would probably suggest visualizing different models for each country, and then you'd be able to compare these trends. So that means creating an, a NARIMA model um, for each country and then plotting for each country, yeah. All right, um, I'm just gonna spend the next 10 minutes running through section two. I do realize we're short on time, but I'll leave some uh, time for any questions at the end. But yeah, so hopefully you've all in downloaded the um, crime data in R package, which we're seeing um, in the intro and prerequisites. To install this, you can just use install.packages. If you have an older version of R, I'd suggest using the dev.tools um, install GitHub link, but Nevertheless, uh, I'm going to be using the um, data from Detroit and from the years 2015 to 2020. You can use the function cities, years and type to obtain this data from the crime data in our package. Um, you can have a look at the website to see which cities are available and which years are available for those cities. Um, I think the list crime data function will tell you which years are available for each city, but I'm going to avoid running that now just because it will take a few minutes to obtain all that information. But yeah, I'm only interested in five years of data from Detroit. So if we run this, we'll see a um, you see a warning sign, but that's that's you can absolutely ignore that. And now we've just obtained all the information from Detroit using uh, the get.crimes data function. So let's briefly explore the state section to see what we're dealing with. We can use the head function to explore the first five rows. So what we have is an ID number. We have the city name, which is obviously Detroit because we filtered just for Detroit. We have an offense code, we have an offense type, we have an offense group, and we have the date. We also have a um, number between last year, but this isn't necessary for this talk. This is a simply interested in that date variable, as well as the offences. Um, so our first object kind of to group these crimes by offence type to see how many we have. So we can use the pipe function, that's the one, um, to obtain this in one line of code. And if we run this, we'll open up this new data set, which gives us the number of crimes per offence type. Uh, I'm not sure why we have two codes right there, but yeah, it does the same thing. Um, as I said, our interest, said, well, our interest is in um, burglary but yeah we have 56 different crime types which can be really difficult to model so your first step in analysis would be to um, figure out how to group these crime types so you may have noticed that some of our crime types are really low for example we have um, like a peeping tom with only one count from five years we have operating and promoting assisting gambling only two counts from five years and these counts, these really low counts will cause so much noise in your data set because there's not enough uh, previous data to make these predictions. So one way to reduce this noise is by grouping those crime categories with less than an X amount. So if we group by the offence type rather than Uh, apologies, I've uh, 
I'm going to uh, change the name of the crime object to Detroit as the rest of the data set reference this is as Detroit. So just override that with the um, Detroit variable and give us 30 seconds to run. Apologies about that. Let that run. There we go. Now, if we head back to, yeah, this code, there we go. Now we're grouped by, yeah, defense group all works. Yeah, so we have these really low counts, but one way to reduce this is to um, remove those small counts and group these into its own category of like minor offenses. So the first step is to convert your offense group variable to a character. And I do this by using the mutate function from the diplo package. And then we can go ahead and um, remove the minor counts by pulling these out of the data set. And then um, that's using the pull function. And we've set the X amount to less than 1,000. So any crimes that are less than 1,000 will be grouped into a new category called minor crimes, which are just easier to deal with. And then we can pull these back into this data set and call this crime minor crash queries less than 1,000. So if we do that now, we can then view this new category. And you see that we only now have 22 different offense types rather than 36. And our minor crimes are now listed here. So we have 3,440 minor crimes, which looks much more better in that table. Um, that was if now, um, if we were following the like case study from the lecture slides, we're simply interested in like the burglary counts. So this step is only really necessary if you're interested in exploring other crime types, but I thought I'd leave that in there in case you um, yeah, wanted to explore your own data sets or try this, try this yourself. But yeah, let's just filter for um, burglary slash breaking and entering as this was what was mentioned in the slides, our case study. So we can just filter by offense group and select that crime type. And I'm also only selecting uh, the variable city name, offense group and date single as that longitude and latitude in the census wasn't really of interest. And now if we view this data set, we have a much neater data set with our three variables. Um, yeah, so now we can talk a little bit more about the object uh, object class and how we can plot a time series data with um, data frames that aren't TS objects. So as you can see, the Detroit data set is a data frame, is a tibble. Um, but there are some functions within the package fable which require you to turn a data set into a TS object. But you can still create time storage plots using um, things like ggplot. So let's go ahead and just skip to line 157 it is, and we're going to show you how to plot a TS object using ggplot. The first steps involve converting your time variable into a readable class in R. This is because we're not converting the whole data frame into a time series object, but we're just letting R know that our time variable which is our date single, is in fact a time object and we want this to be represented as such. So I'm calling on a new object called X and I'm mutating um, the date single object into a new variable called week using the year week function evident by here. And then we can count this and we count the, the number of weeks. Once we run this, we can then view the data set and now we have a number of burglary counts per week from 2015 to 2020. Um, if we view this new week variable as well by using the class function, we'll see that this is registered as a date and not a character variable, which is exactly what you want if you are um, wanting to plot your time variable on that x-axis. So using ggplot, we could plot something like this. This is a really... Um, Simplify ggplot, but we're calling on x and then using the pipe function to call on ggplot. We set our aesthetics to um, the week and our x value to the to the time variable and our y value to the observations. Um, I'm using geom point and then some other uh, complicated geometries to basically make our x axes 
um, look like this. So this is the plot that we saw on the slides. So it gives us that nice like regression line between the points. Um, and yeah, now we have that weekly um, crime count of burglary. Just a little top tip, you can do all of that, including the mutation um, that is counting the crime per week in just one line of code. So you can use um, this function here. I just controlled shift and seed that to uncomment all of that. But yeah, now we just have that same plot, but run in one line of code. And I've also included some X and um, include some titles for the X and Y axes. Um, I'm a little bit aware of the time, but I guess there isn't too much to go through. So what I'm doing now is converting our crime object into a time series object so we can explore some of those decompositions as previously addressed. So we're using that TS object to do so. And in this instance, I'm um, the data I'm using is the X object, which is that weekly crime count. But I'm calling on by um, using the dollar sign, I'm calling on the number of crime counts. I'm addressing the frequency of 52 weeks and I'm setting a start and end date. So if we run this and then we use that plot.ts function, we will get a time series object that looks something like this. So this is um, our trend count for the burglary. We can go ahead and run some decompositions on this. You can um, decide, you can clash your, your types as additive or multiplicative, or we can simply do it um, how we run this in the previous slide. So if we just run all of these at once, so I'll explain these. So here we have a decomposition using the additive model. We can definitely see that we have some seasonal trends of repeated patterns from, from each year. Um, and here we have a multiplicative trend. Not much difference to be, set, to be said, really. Um, but this is why we use, this is why I prefer the decompose function from the stats package, because this automatically tells you that we have an additive time series which is really useful. And the last little thing I'd just like to discuss is the importance of accounting for like holidays in your data set. So if you did want to include um, additional like uh, values, that is like the bank holiday effect, then this is the code you would use to do so. Um, we use the time date uh, function. And if you explore like the crown R package for this, there's a different um, holiday function for different cities. Um, this actually should not say London, that should say New York City, I think it's NY, yeah, NYC, because we're using American data. So just make sure that's changed. And then this will basically indicate a binary variable for each week, indicating if there is a um, bank holiday on that week. And then you could include this into your um, time series models. Um, yeah, that is the end of the R code. I hope I've been able to demonstrate some ways in which we can explore rolling averages and decomposition methods uh, and looked at some of those visualizations that we can use to plot our data. And yeah, thank you um, all for listening. The time is closing out. So here are my contact details if you have any further questions and the resources that were used for this, um, this webinar can be found on this slide. So. Thank you all for listening and thank you all for attending.